Hi everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome to our first live stream of the localization news. My name is Andre Zito. I hope all, all of you can hear me well. Uh, this is the first time that we're hosted by Multilingual and we will be streaming the localization news on the Multilingual social media from today. This is the first time that we set our foot into the live streaming scene. <laughs> and I'm very happy that I'm not here alone to, to bear this burden on my own. I have my two regular guests now with me, uh, Virka and Ilan. Guys, hello, how are you? Hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> okay, how are you doing? The usual question. Ladies first. Doing great. Um, great to be here with all of you. And uh, um, yes, it's, uh, it's been a very interesting time in, in the US. I am. I live. I live in Seattle, and uh, so so for us in the United States, we're just uh, living through some historical times. So just watching that, and, and uh, but doing great. For people who don't watch the the U.S. news, what is actually going on in America? Yes, we have a presidential election, which I think. A lot of the people, even outside of the United States, are interested in the outcome of uh, it. Might change, change, uh, change the world, <laughs> maybe. So, so yeah, I think that's at the top of everyone's minds at the moment. Did you already vote? I voted early. Uh, we hear we. It's kind of interesting in the United States. Each state has little different uh, rules and different way of. Voting uh, in Washington State, where I live, uh, we have only mail-in ballots uh, or remote voting, if you may. So we receive the ballots at home. We can just, uh, fill that, fill them uh, in, and then we can either deposit them in the uh, mailboxes, especially, uh, especially um, intended for for the elections, or we can put them in the mail. So. I, I voted um, three weeks ago, and you can then track your ballot. So I, I could see that it was counted and it was um, accepted. So what they do is they match our signature on the envelope, and then then they count it. Wow. So, yeah. So it's kind of cool. You can track. You can see what happens to your ballot. This is, this is not a political uh, vidcast, but... Who did you vote for? No. <laughs> did you vote for <laughs> Trump or against Trump? Against oh, Trump. <laughs> actually, that's my okay. that's my question. Do you think that is this about Biden or is this more about are you against Trump or for Trump? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, they are saying that people who voted for Trump are actually voting for Trump. People mm -hmm. that they're not uh, voting against Biden, for example, right? But. But they're saying that 30% of people who are voting for Biden uh, are voting for him. The rest is voting uh, against Trump. So, so yeah, um, it is huge. Yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting. But uh, myself personally, I voted for uh, more sanity and for uh, just more more compassionate nation um, and so that's me personally that's yours that that's sense. yeah it fits you because you're like the sweetheart from czech republic who immigrated <laughs> so you have these nice ideals you're not like the hardcore you know no I, i'm people, total like, idealist right. <laughs> yeah. to, to a fault <laughs> so okay ilan what about you and compassion is what we're going to talk about today um Very good, very good. A uh, lot of things have happened since last time. Um, we started to ease on the lockdown, which is good mm. news. Um, doesn't change much because you're not going anywhere anyways, but at least you can, which is, uh, <laughs> which is nice. Um, Did it affect that, your I, kids? Can they go to school now or no? My older ones uh, have been on Zoom since day one, so it doesn't change for them. They, they still don't go to school. Mm -hmm. school comes to home and my little one yeah she, she's in she's in school which is good 
<laughs> um, apart from that, I don't have a side project yet, and I'm still working on that. So we are working on it together, right? If you have, we'll talk about it yeah. very, very soon. Very soon. Very, very soon. Um, just one technical thing for the people who are actually watching us live. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, if you can see in the chat, there's a box right below me. That means uh, the chat. Uh, so everything that you guys type in the chat uh, will be displayed on the stream. And we highly encourage you to participate in the discussion with us. If you have any comments about articles or if you have any follow-up questions, your opinions, just feel free to share with us on the chat wherever you are watching us and where that is actually. So right now we're streaming on Multilingual's YouTube channel. I think we should be live on Multilingual's Twitter and Facebook. And we're also uh, abusing Nimsy's LinkedIn and we're streaming to their LinkedIn because Multilingual's LinkedIn hasn't been approved for live stream yet. So you can see us on Nimsy's LinkedIn. So hello, hello, hello. And if you can hear me, at least this is my request. Please at least say hi to see so that I can see if it's working or not. So that's it. Um, one thing that I would like to before before we get into the localization things, you know, <laughs> the the boring stuff. Uh, let's talk about how we feel right now. You know, this is our first time that we're doing this live. Are you guys nervous or no? I think I am a little bit nervous. <laughs> I'm still trying to put myself you know to be present here with you so that we feel like like this is just like a casual chat as it has always been and the reason why i'm asking this is because from my experience uh when we keep this like stress or like i'm nervous about something to ourselves like it's worse than just saying it out loud because when you say it it loses control over you so i wanted to share with you how i'm feeling about this i'm excited I think like I'm getting in, getting the momentum, you know, like getting into the conversation with you, but I still feel like there's a little bit of pressure. I can actually feel it like at the back of my eyes for some reason when I feel like I'm not totally present. So um, how are you guys feeling about us being live right now? That's interesting is what you're saying about uh, relieving the pressure by talking about it, because if you didn't feel it, now you do feel it because you're getting the pressure from the other. <laughs> so, no, I was all right until then. Oh, but, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I agree. I agree with Elon. But <laughs> why did you bring that up? <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I think I'm, I'm really excited because I think this is something I've never done uh, going live uh, like this. And um, so it's exciting. Well, so, by the way, we have yeah. our first person in the chat, uh, Viviana Di Giulio from Mallorca. She okay. says hello. Hello, Viviana. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. It's working. It's working. Okay. That's great. So <clears throat> I'm not nervous anymore. Okay. I'm spreading the not being nervous to you guys. Good vibes. Yes. Right. Good vibes. Good vibes. <laughs> So last time, the reason why I liked our last conversation is because we decided to save the world <laughs> and we established the multi-market Avengers. Easy. So um, we left the meeting with some action items, uh, mostly for you. <laughs> so I would like to know what has been done in this area and what are we doing? So should I start? Yeah, go or, Okay. So I have contacted um, um, Translators Without Borders and had a long chat with Manuel Anaske, who just joined them. Not long maybe ago. we should just maybe we should just remind everyone what's right. the what, what the challenge was, is. Right, what was the challenge? So, so the article we discussed last time uh, during our localization news had to do with underrepresented languages and the messaging around COVID that. Um, many, many countries and many nations or, um, different, uh, locales, um, have the advantage of going to machine translation to, to make those messages understood and, uh, that there is coverage, um, if they need to maybe Google what they need to do to prevent the spread of COVID, for example. Um, but for some others, this is very difficult to achieve because there is no machine translation coverage for their language or not even a related language. So our challenge was to see how we can help 
being we are all in, a, in this industry, we have access to linguists, we have uh, also seen challenges when we have to um, move some messaging to to um, to be able to to uh, reach different uh, different uh, locales. So so we thought this would be a good way to see if we can uh, from our capacity reach out to um, different organizations and offer um, some help. So I have met up with uh, Manuela Nasca from uh, Translators Without Borders and discussed with her um, what uh, Translators Without Borders are doing for COVID in particular and how are they reaching those uh, challenging locales with with the messaging and uh, and from that really um, it was an interesting discussion because we just uh, were not discussing COVID only but we were discussing in general how difficult it is to be able to provide uh, correct information to different areas and different locales. So what she told me is that for COVID in particular, they are working with WHO and they are reaching out to um, mainly African um, countries and uh, they're trying to find liaisons within the different communities. And she told me something which I really didn't think about that much um, until I spoke with her, that sometimes the challenge is not looking for a translator or translating the message, but the challenge is that there are people who are illiterate, for example, in those areas, and the written messaging would not even help them. Mm -hmm. So what they are doing is they're finding people in the community who are able to record the message, for example, or um, who can in some way broadcast the messages you know within the community but she told me that that one of the big challenges translators without borders are running into is that they have to sometimes people volunteer to do this but they don't necessarily always um translate the message this uh, carefully or accurately they might inject some of their own um point of view if you may into the message and that they don't have a uh, professional linguist who do this so what they would benefit from and this is from this platform i would like to encourage others in the uh language service um uh, companies um, to provide training, for example, for the those linguists with translators without border um, are connecting with and provide them interpretation training, provide them any kind of best practices. So those messages can be correctly and carefully translated and then broadcast or or however the mode of um, delivery would would end up being so so that was one one thing i would like to kind of um suggest and mention the other thing too is that many of us work with languages which um are really hard to cover for translators without border and um what what i decided to do is to um, spark interest within our language resource pool to encourage our linguists to get involved, to help, to offer their help, to um, be able to be that, you know, that voice for their community and uh, provide that information to those communities. So this is where I'm encouraging all of you listening from other LSPs. <laughs> to see if that would be something where you can help try to spark the interest with your linguist and uh, and also volunteer and, and provide some of the best practices because I think that this is something what uh, translators without borders would really appreciate. So so that is my message and that's um, that's where things are at the moment. Thank you for sharing. When you were talking about the training, two things that come to my mind. 
translators without borders, I would assume that they would have some training for translators. And yeah, they do. They do, but not as much. That mm -hmm. um, that's what I was told. That 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 would be something they would really benefit uh, from. Um, so, I mean, what I was thinking about is hosting web some webinars or offering some webinars for their linguists um, who they could attend and. And it could be more of an interactive webinar. It could be something also um, multilingual um, and NIMSI perhaps would want to be involved with. Um, so just suggestions, but this is where the need is. Shout out to Translators Without Borders and for the good work they are doing. That's interesting. I, I have a question, yeah. The, 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 the lack of translators is because they don't cover those languages and they don't have... I assume that translator with the borders was counting only on uh, on volunteers. Do, 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 do they pay for translations? I believe they do uh, for some. I'm not quite sure. I couldn't really okay. speak on that, but I know that they are um, they are looking in different communities and they do work with uh, WHO. I would imagine WHO has a budget for localization so you know not quite sure i cannot speak on that um okay. definitely big part is volunteer for sure but then there was what you're saying or what they're saying is that they're a um, the, 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 the 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 lack of care or accuracy is because those are not professional translators and anybody right. volunteers or do they come with an agenda of what they want to the message to be regardless which yeah i think i think for some of those communities it's really hard to know if this linguist is proficient or you know if they are giving the right message because they don't have a qa on it because how would they qa some very rare language or even just a dialect or, you know, regional, very regional um, a language used orally only. So, so yeah, I, I think those are challenges I didn't think about really. Uh, and, uh, and uh, it was eye opening to, to, to hear that those are one of the biggest challenges there. So. That's, so that's in any good. way, I think it's a good, it's a good, I am encouraging people to think about that challenge and uh, maybe uh, propose solutions. Um, but uh, I think where we can help right from the gate is uh, with some of the interpretation training and, uh, and with sparking the interest with those languages where they have challenge to, to source. And, and I was told it's a lot of the African languages. Where the big need is. Just saying hello to the chat to Joshua Velasquez. He said my microphone was a little bit low. Can you guys hear me well? I think I increased it a little bit. You we guys can, can hear me well? Me. Good. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So going back to the topic, it's funny that when you mentioned the, the lack of QA, which is kind of like a paradox, because if you think about it, if there's a lack of QA, how do people know that the translations are not accurate? Well, that's what... Some of their feedback apparently has been, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from the community that mm. sometimes those people, and I don't want to be speaking out of term or making right. assumptions here, right? But what I understood is that sometimes those linguists who volunteer use that platform to propagate their message. Mm. And um, so that they might get some feedback. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I made much less progress, I must say. Um, Sorry, Elon, one, more, one more thing that I wanted to oh, say yeah. about the training. You know, like, do we actually need to ask, let's say, NIMS or Multilingual? Because I'm pretty sure that most of the companies actually do have a training for the translators. Don't you guys have a training when you onboard new people for translators? For, yeah. Yeah, for translators and for interpreters, we mm -hmm. do. But for for translators without borders, for their translators, you know, or for their interpreters, those interpreters who are not professional interpreters, who are 
just living in the community and they need to record a message or they are they are called in to interpret for someone in a medical setting for example um they are not professional interpreters so how they conduct that interpreting session is maybe not you know not correct <laughs> so so in those cases, if we could provide that, I, I was when I was just talking to Manuela, we were a little bit just uh, exchanging some ideas, and you know, I was saying maybe we can provide some recorded trainings, or we can just provide best practices. Um, and uh, she thought that that would be very helpful. What about you, Elon? Do you have any training already in place? Yeah, we do. We do train. But it's mostly technical for uh, new tools that they, they wouldn't have used before. Um, the, 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 the linguists that we recruit, they're, they're already trained. They're professional linguists, so so it's less on the on the necessity of accuracy when you transfer your message, not to add your own opinions. Uh, that's that's a I I take that's a little bit for granted. So so there w- we wouldn't have so much training to to offer. Right. But um, maybe uh, the recruitment is a is a problem, and, and we need to to help them find those linguists, provided they exist, of course. Mm-hmm. So that they don't rely on non professionals. Right. Right. And, and translators without border, they have um, in-kind sponsorship, which um, is not necessarily um, just monetary where you donate money, but you can also offer different types of support. You know, so so again, on their website, um, there are uh, ways people can get uh, involved, and uh, LSPs can get involved or or um, SLVs can get involved and uh, and support um, their mission there. So what they would need, from what I understand, is like a crash course for people who want to become a translator in, let's say, I don't know, a week. Mm-hmm. Even less, right? Maybe even less, I think. <laughs> yeah, like a couple yeah, hours. That, that, <laughs> that reminds me, I, I think I know who I'm going to reach out to. Um, I think my second interview that I did for my podcast was with Laszlo Kovac. Uh, he's the CEO of a uh, Hungarian LSP that I had very, very good uh, experience with. And I was talking to him about uh, training new people, including translators. And he told me that the way that he finds the new talented translators is that he doesn't expect them to have any degree or any form of education. He just gives them a, a test which is about mm-hmm. how good you are naturally with the language that you have. Because, you know, there are things that you can teach people and there's like a talent for something. Maybe people have mm-hmm. been writing their whole life, you know, so they have the, they have the right thing to, to convey the message in their, in their own language. And then they just kind of like give them the basics, like what a translator does and maybe how to use cat tools. So I think he might have some idea about how to shorten the length from there's a person who has never heard of a translator's job to actually getting them to translate something accurately. So I think he might point us in the right de- direction or help us with this. I don't know. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm thinking. So that's what I can take on. Okay. What about you, Elon? So <laughs> you are supposed to get in touch with WHO. So we technically already yeah. connected. So we're not with there him. yet. We're, we're not there yet. We're, borders, right? But we're making progress. Um, um, I went through the official channels uh, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and uh, the person in charge of keeping in touch with the uh, WHO and other uh, health uh, or organizations worldwide. Uh, and that's where we are at the moment. So they wanted to know exactly what languages we're talking about, how... Because it's uh, formal, it's it's got formal. So so I need I need to to get more information mm-hmm. in, in order to to be sent to the right person. Right. But, um, 
do we still think that the problem is with the minority languages or do you think that they're also struggling with the with the big languages for which we have a lot of translators yeah i did, did that didn't seem like um that's where the struggle is yeah i think there's a lot of information out there and uh and so there's access for sure um it's it's those um underrepresented uh, languages you know whether uh, and those dialects i guess you know mm -hmm. being able to make sh making sure that the right message is being being uh, given in the community and again i think and this is my personal observation and even when i talked to manuel we kind of validated it it's uh, there's a lot of even political or or um you know um i guess um religious influence so so sometimes um a message quite innocent message might seem to the the people suspicious because they have had bad um some bad experience with you know coming from from politics or even from the religion so so that's another challenge to give credibility so so it's coming from a place where it's credible that message is coming from 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 a space of credibility and uh that it it is um uh, accurate mm -hmm. Now I'm just actually thinking like what would be our next step in this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure, Ilan, if it actually makes sense to talk, to try to get more information out of WHO if they're already kind of like partnering up with translators without borders, because then it might seem like like we're trying to be the 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 the, the competition to them. Yeah. Um, maybe we should just focus on helping translators without borders. And maybe we should get Manuela to to the show. That would be great. I think she's uh, she's someone of you know great integrity and uh, and uh, someone who is very knowledgeable in this area. Yeah. So so, so yeah, Manuela, I think it would be great. This Manuela, if you're here, <laughs> just uh, pop in. We're waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> this is live. <laughs> Yeah, maybe she's not here right now because uh, we're just starting out. So I think, Virka, you can take this on. Maybe you can invite her to, to, to mm -hmm. our next session. And in the meantime, is there anything else that we can do? I'll reach out to Laszlo about the training. And then mm -hmm. maybe I can circle back to, to you guys and Manuela. And um, so that's the training. Do you right. think there's anything then, when it comes to yeah. finding people with the... Uh, with the niche language uh, mm -hmm. specialization, is that maybe where the big people like multilingual Lindsay or Slater could help out to find those people? In the I network? would think so. Yeah, I think this would be a good good shout out to all of you SLVs in Africa, and you know even other areas of the world, Asia. Um, you know where you might have some um, some resources where you might have linguists you are working with um, would be great if if we um, if you could reach if you want to you can reach out to us and we will connect you in the proper way or go directly to translators without border with your with your offer of um, help um, so I think this is uh, this is a kind of a call for for help and um, for doing some good. We're good adventures, right? Yeah, we're, we're, good. <laughs> we're, we're compassion. Right. <laughs> compassion <laughs> is our, yeah, our mission here. I'm just trying to think like how we can use what we just said. Like, should I just cut it into a clip and send it to, to Slater, Multilingual Limsy and like, hey, put this on your social media every day <laughs> at 12 p.m. so that people react. I think I think we need, you know, like contact us. It's it's a little bit ambiguous because people that will then need to find you. I think maybe we should point them directly to translators without borders. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't know. Do they have yeah. any like a sign up form or like or yeah they do. They they do. You can go on their website and there's many ways you can get involved. 
what I can, uh, what we can do is we can probably um, maybe put out a little call for help uh, and formulate it in the right way. Uh, mm-hmm. So people are directed, um, directed to the right place. Yeah, Mika, and, this is uh, for you, <laughs> if you're watching. <laughs> That's our marketing think, director. Yes, and I think, uh, again, we can, I will reach out to Manuela and uh, invite her to our next uh, news. And um, we can probably get even more detailed uh, information and way we can all get involved a little more. We don't want to overwhelm the uh, translators without border either. <laughs> so right. if there is, yeah. So so let's uh, let's kind of uh, bend with them and do it uh, in a way where it would make sense. I'm still thinking about like last time we identified that the that what we're going to do, especially Elon, is to find the gap. Like WHO has these languages covered and these are the languages that they have not covered. Is that the information that we can get from the translators without the borders so that the message that we send out to the people is more specific? They're like, like hey, if you, see your, if you find yourself in this list of languages and you speak these languages, please go contact. Because then we might end up like either people with... with 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 languages that are already covered will will submit something which will lead to overwhelming translators without borders like you said Virka <clears throat> or the people who are i don't know who are representing the small languages they will not react because the message will be kind of like a very global you know like if, if the more targeted you are the more mm-hmm. you can right. speak to the people yeah i think it would be good to have a list of languages so so yeah let's try to that could be my my uh uh commitment for next time get the list yeah i think you should ha- have it with ilan so that you guys also oh. do something together <laughs> outside of this session okay yeah we can ilan and i will bend together so on this yeah. ilan needs his side project unless ilan you have some other ideas what we could do no i think that's definitely the the first thing to do is to to identify the gap, and that was uh, the purpose of contacting WHO directly. But, but yeah, if if translator without borders is, is already the one single point of entry for translation as far as WHO is concerned, then we might as well just go with them, and, uh, mm-hmm. and we'll know which. Yeah, thing. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they're the single point, mm. um, you know, of uh, contact for WHO. That that I don't know. Um, but I know they're working with them on those African languages. Mm. So perhaps it might be just for that. And that's, you know, I, I did not clarify that, but yeah, I think yeah. we can get, we can get the gap list. Yeah. That's actually a good point that they, there might be other people involved. Mm-hmm. So I guess, Ilan, I think you can still work on <laughs> getting in touch with WHO and seeing how it how it how it works. By the way, we have a comment from Joshua again on LinkedIn. And this is a good point. It talks about the technology. So he says that there are some free cloud-based offers with a very low learning curve, like MateCat, I have never heard that, and SmartCat. That will help mm-hmm. us per technology and productivity. So Virka, do you have any insight into what tools they're using or expecting the volunteers to use for the translation? No, I don't have any um, any visibility into that. To me, it sounded like um, they do have certainly a technology um, department within Translators Without Border. Um, I'm not quite sure if they are using CAD tools or, you know, if they... If they are, um, I would assume so, but for some of the dialects we were discussing, that to me sounded like a language which doesn't even maybe have written form or anything where um, that it would have a keyboard, perhaps. Um, mm. So, so uh, you know, again, these were very rare uh, languages for maybe very small, small group of people who speak them. So, but that's a good point that uh, for um, some of the languages, I would assume that they would have translation memories um, that they can recycle um, the, the translation. So, 
Mm-hmm. Definitely a good point. And um, maybe we can discuss that with Manuela when she's here. Okay. I had one more thing when you were talking about the voice, that the voice localization might be more necessary than the written translation. The, the, the thing that I remembered was I know that Mozilla had this open source project. I think they created some some engine for for voice recognition and i think it's called deep speech and it's open source so people can tap into the data and they can create something out of it and i think mozilla usually covers a lot of these niche languages as well i think mozilla mm-hmm. was translated into like firefox was translated into i don't know 180 languages or something like that if i'm not mistaken so they have a lot of things so i'm not sure if translators without borders are aware of that and if it's or, and if it's a data that could be used for for this project mm-hmm. i don't know that's another thing that i was thinking right, right. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> we have more comments from joshua thank you joshua for being so active <laughs> pontoon pontoon yeah so joshua says oh we have javi javi hello javi <laughs> Uh, so Joshua says, in terms of linguistic competence, what Andre is explaining, no degree needed, is something that is being addressed in the multicultural marketing space. Academics and experts explain that most translations aren't done keeping in mind the education level, including the social, cultural, and personal circumstances of the final reader. Complex topic. If a message isn't relevant or clear, it won't matter if the comma or period was in the right place. That's a good point. Definitely. I think that kind of goes hand in hand with our today's article on plain language writing, but uh, let's wait. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Stay so, tuned, Joshua. So um, <laughs> Avengers, are we, are we done with our session? <laughs> Anything else for this first part of our initiative? We have our to do's. We're ready to go. Good. Right. Ready to go. So let's start with the, the news coverage. I'll, I'll try to be quick. Uh, so the because my uh, my device is very limited. This is all I have, and my phone is, by the way, actually a little bit broken, so it's very difficult to read the text. Uh, the The article, actually, a bunch of articles that I pick for today, is related to the Amazon's screw up when it comes to entering the Swedish market. And I'm pretty sure if you don't live under a rock, and if you look at your LinkedIn feed. Uh, from time to time, you would notice that Amazon has had a huge translations issues when they launched their Swedish website. A uh, couple of the things that I would bring up from the from the examples is uh, I'll start with the video games because that's what my that's my favorite topic. Uh, one video game, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, was translated as The Savage's Breath, while a racing game Need for Speed Payback, uh, this is what I'm familiar with, was displayed as Do You Require Speed Refund? <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Another game, Watch Dogs 2, became Look at Dogs 2, while Star Wars Battlefront 2 became Star Wars Battery Front. Okay. Meanwhile, an airfix box containing models of Russian infantry became Russian infants, while Nintendo's video game console, the Nintendo Switch, became the Nintendo Circuit Breaker. Okay. And then there are a couple of more that are more offensive, I think, to satisfy (laughs) the audience uh, that we have right now. I will skip on those. I'll just mention a few things. We're PG-13, we can't say that. Right. Yes, yeah. (laughs) I I thought that you dealt with your kids, Ilan. (laughs) (laughs) Other guesses were more vulgar. Calvin Klein boxer shorts turned into men's luggage trunks, while pair earrings were described as being ideal for European prostitutes. There we go. And I think I'll stop there. (laughs) When I was reading this is... Guys, I want your theory how can this happen in the first place is it because they don't have the mt engine for swedish trained or or what what is going on with your knowledge of mt 
yeah, I think raw machine translation kind of took over. <laughs> so with no QA or no, not yet. Mm. Um, I think one other thing too, which which I found interesting was that on their um, they have used the uh, Argentinian flag oh, yeah. instead of Swedish flag for the language. And that, that to me is even more mind boggling how that could happen. You know, machine yeah. translation going crazy. Those, all of those mistranslations that kind of is in line with machine translation, you know, um, how, so the ambiguity there, uh, of English, but, um, the Swedish Argentinian flag, um, that's a big one. Yeah, you're very correct because that's something that's not set by a machine, right? That's not something that comes out of algorithm, I assume. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Um, now, do you think it was intended? I think yeah. I saw it somewhere. Actually, I was checking our multilingual site and I think there was an article that this was whole just like planned. Kind of like the IKEA thing, if you guys yeah, remember. IKEA yeah. did it. We so, do it too. I mean. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On a larger scale, right? Like do it, right? <laughs> Amazon scale. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I don't think it was intended. You know, I, yeah, uh, I think, I think it, they just thought that uh, machine translation would suffice. You know, I, I mean, I've worked uh, with companies which do product listing and they try to go that direction and it usually uh, unless you train for some time and you really um, watch the outcome for for a long period of time to to tweak it so it performs well um, it's usually a disaster on product listing so so I would think in this case I mean uh, Sounds to me like uh, like uh, uh, that was empty. And one other thing too, I noticed that they were not too apologetic about it. It <laughs> it seemed like they were very much wanting to gloss over and forget it. Where IKEA really uh, took those extra steps and wasn't shying away from it. Where Amazon wants everyone to just have amnesia now and forget about it. Yeah, but it's a bit different because. Ikea sells Ikea and Amazon sells whatever every vendor there. is going to, mm -hmm. to put there. If you look at the translated version of uh, AliExpress, or it's interesting as well. So, and why should they care? I mean, the, the, the buyer doesn't care. So here it's, it's funny because, because it's funny or it's offensive, but how how bad does it reflect on on amazon themselves uh even if it's not intended i i don't think it's i don't think it would yeah, care I, right. it, I do with the exception, yeah with the exception of the flag i'd say you know yeah. the flag um yeah, the that flag, would flag. be offensive to swedish buyers i would think yeah that's a that's a very good point that you guys bring up that it's amazon is mostly user generated content and mm -hmm. for that, you need to use MT. So you probably have to start somewhere at some point. I'm just thinking about like, if you're deploying MT on such a scale, like how much preparation can you do before that? Like how much is the cost involved in training it to a certain stage where once you launch MT for a real marketplace like Amazon, that it would not have these kind of issues. Or if this is just like their MVP. For those of mm -hmm. you who don't know what MVP means, it's like a minimum viable product. So we launch like with the minimum set of features so that the users will not kill us, but they will start using it and we will get better over time. Yeah, um, it's, it's a good point. And I think it's a business decision, you know, what, whatever they want to do. I, I know, for example, eBay is, you know, it's a similar type of uh, uh Set up. Um, they have trained their engine for a very long time before they went raw empty. Um, so um, I and I am seeing it, you know, 
currently, um, you know, we, we have at Accorby a, a, a client who is similar, also um, product placements. And uh, same thing, they, they actually got burned by having uh, someone apply machine translation to their product. And, uh, and it really turned off the buyers. And so that we, you know, we were just working with them and something, doing something very careful where machine translation is used to a certain degree, but not raw and, uh, and heavy training. You know, what would be actually interesting to me, it would be interesting to see how fast they recover and how fast the changes get into the site. Because what I remember from the articles is that they were very encouraging people to submit these issues. So I'm just wondering if people did that and how fast mm -hmm. it reflected on the website. Maybe even if we had time right now, you could look for the, <laughs> the chicken hat, <laughs> Elon, <laughs> to see if they're still translated as uh, something, something. <laughs> but, but yeah, that, that, that's what I'm thinking. Because mm -hmm. if they, if they do it fast, like yeah. people will forget about it and probably nobody will come back to this. Like, like Elon, I think you were pointing out that people would just forget about this eventually, especially mm -hmm. if the issues will be fixed. But to me, it would be interesting to see the recovery. No, but take, take also in consideration the, the number of products they have and how many mistakes. So here, Twitter uh, was a nice relay for, for all the, the, the big funny ones. Um, the most offensive, mm. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but what, what does it represent in, in, in our catalog and every, every other, uh, suite logging in and looking for whatever, uh, I don't know, keyboards, screwdrivers, whatever I have around me, uh, <laughs> and, and there it's going to, to appear just right. So it's, a. Uh, I'm not sure. And again, I believe I believe customers don't care that much because yeah. they they have, you know, it reminds me a little bit of the um, of the funny behavior. I mean, the unlikely behavior of, uh, of uh, computer displays in uh, in bidirectional. And and as soon as you have a uh, two languages, like I'm, I'm more uh, familiar with Hebrew and English, but uh, and it switches direction and, and your sentence is, is all over the place. Okay. You type a, a, a message in a, I don't know, a, a very famously used uh, messenger uh, application and, and you have two languages and, and it's all over. And, and people got used to it and they, and they know to decipher that. And so, so true. It doesn't appear nice. It, it should be like this, but okay. I can live with it. So, so I don't recognize the rape seed under the rape, but I got there because I was looking for, for that thing. I'm not, I didn't search for rape in the, <laughs> in the Amazon catalog and, and found the, 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 the rape seed, uh, whatever it was. So, so it's okay. I, I understood. I got it. I can buy my product now. Yeah. So I maybe for what... some products, it's, it's turning off if you're talking about. Right um that type of products that you can be turned up but uh we're not naming anyone so uh but for uh for for whatever you're you're going to buy uh, on amazon uh, mostly maybe it's so uh, it's not that bad and we're making them a lot of promotion we we just gave we are we are 20 again, minutes <laughs> right i i think though too it's the type of product as you said right if it's you know, basic products like spoons and books and things like that, fine. But when the product includes ingredients, for example, in, you know, things which if they are mistranslated because of machine translation, and they could harm someone because they were incorrectly translated by the machine translation engine, <clears throat> um, that so that that would be an interesting I, uh, question: Is how are they applying machine translation across everything they sell, or just on certain products or certain type of products? Mm 
you know, are they are they also health and beauty? Are is are they um, applying machine translation on that? Or there's, you know, definitely ingredients uh, um, type of uh, compliance in some countries. Uh, or so so those are questions which we don't I don't know unless we do some deeper research into this. But I think what was funny is was the the mis- translation which was um, comical and um, inappropriate action item for me reach out to jeff bezos find right. out Absolutely. <laughs> see how far you'll get yeah, that, that's actually a very good point like if they apply mt for everything you know what well, like when you were talking about it what i was thinking what if they just apply mt on the products that are submitted by people what if the products that are sold by Amazon directly that has a better mm-hmm. translation? Maybe. Yeah, we don't know. I guess we don't know what. And another what... question for you guys, like Virka, you were talking the example with eBay that they were training their MT a long time before they launched. What kind of data were they using? What kind of data could have Amazon used to make the MT better? What kind of data? So I would think that um, if it's diverse products like they do, you know, do they have uh, maybe translation memories they can start using to train from those different areas like, you know, automotive or mechanical or, you know, um, photo and I don't know, the different um, different areas. Can they um, train with that data? Um, that that would be, I guess, one area where you can we can you can go in. the The challenge with those type of uh, retailers or the e-commerce is that, as far as the terminology, glossaries, and style, that's challenging because they are receiving the products from different manufacturers, from different companies. So to find any type of specialized uh, glossary, um, which could which could suggest Amazon, you know, which could suggest eBay, uh, you you have to apply that only on on the skin. You cannot really go and inject that in the product too much. So um, it could be that they might be getting uh, MT or a data from those specific manufacturers if they are big um, big sellers um, so and then they have some of their like house brand just for uh, you know eBay for example or for um, for you know um, Amazon and, and so on so so I would say something like that I don't know Elon what do you think I have no idea but everything you say, um, <laughs> I, uh, actually, uh, I can, uh, I can set an action item and bring someone from eBay who is working on this. And that, uh, we can do that next time. Or we have Manuela and the, now eBay uh, person. Uh, now yeah. bring Jeff right. Bezos. <laughs> oh, bring Jeff. Bring Jeff too, well, right. Je- Je- Jeff is listening. So maybe you can, uh, Right. Hi Jeff. <laughs> Jeff, tell us. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, you know how we get Jeff, and I still have to do this. I need to set up a <clears throat> Twitch account for Multilingual, so we will be streaming also on Twitch. Mm. That's how you get Jeff. All right. Right now he has no stake in this show, but once we it's move to it. Twitch, yes, he'll want us. Well, he'll want us for okay. um, <laughs> news. <laughs> my my, my last right. comment about this, and then we then we're done with this article. This reminds me of, I think there was a, a documentary or something like that about when the when we had the mortgage crisis, the financial crisis. And I think the document was called something like too big to fail, which was referring to the banks that they're so big and they have so much support that whatever they do, they cannot mm. fail. <clears throat> do you think Amazon is in the same spot that because they're so big and when you think about e-commerce, to me, the first thing that comes to my mind is Amazon that they can live with this thing and recover very fast. And in your experience, has there ever been a company that actually tanked, went down 
because of bad translation? Mm. I don't know of any that bad translation that it killed you, but worst comes worst comes worst. They've lost the Swedish market. With all due respect to the five, seven million Swedes using Amazon in Swedish. So it's, uh, it's really not big. Um, and again, those that would, that would hear about it or uh, stumble about it on it. So that's it's a really, a really small portion of people. Can't believe mm -hmm. the, the, the full catalog is that bad. Well, I have, I have a little different, um, different perspective, and it doesn't really have to do with the language uh, at all. So I don't know if, if it flies, but when Amazon tried to go to the Czech Republic, um, they were planning to launch or put their warehouses and kind of um, get into the center of the Czech Republic around the Brno area. And uh, the city of Brno um, said, no, we don't, we don't want them because it's going to cause a lot of traffic. It's going to change how, how we live. We, we don't want them. And so Amazon was at that time, they already were looking at the land. They were already looking at how they're going to develop it and where they're going to put it. And uh, a little country like Czech Republic said no to Amazon. Uh, and now who knows how they feel about it because they went to Poland and they went to the Slovak Republic. And, uh, and they brought in a lot of, uh, jobs and you know they they kind of brought in this the whole um, Amazon with them but but I think they were a country like that was saying well no to the big guy we don't want a change of how we uh, how we live and how we buy uh, and I'm not saying it's good or bad uh, I'm just saying that that was one approach where even being too big um, it didn't impress them. <laughs> so, yeah. so I, I don't know, you know, it doesn't have anything to do with the language at all. Um, and what we're talking about or what we are here. The for. Czech people have already experienced with that uh, because they are the ones, I think it's, there are four countries in the world where Google is not the most used search engine and Czech Republic is one of them. The people still use Seznam. Seznam, yeah. yes. Yes, right. so mm. maybe. So they, they have real uh, attitude. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, or we do. I do. I am part. It's hard to impress the chick. Yeah. <laughs> I guess so, right? Okay, good. Let's close the topic of Amazon. <clears throat> and let's move on to the next article, which I think will be shared by Ilan. You are the... Right gave us a heads up that it will be about the uh, lost languages. So let's see lost if we can languages. find a connection with what we're doing with translators without borders. Mm -hmm. Maybe. So it's an article that I found on uh, smart to zero, which is a site that's uh, reporting about advances in uh, internet of things and all type of connected devices. Don't ask me what I was doing there and, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and what this article was doing there because I don't know. Um, but I also, it was also uh, then reproduced and, and, uh, and mentioned in uh, last week uh, Slater weekly report uh, and other, other places like uh, Towards Data Science uh, with a very good uh, uh, other report uh, by uh, Sima Tass and, and also in Medium and, and surely plenty other places, including my LinkedIn feed. Um, the idea is that, uh, well, you know, AI and specifically machine learning is used for machine translation, among other things. And lately, uh, the neural networks have had a lot of press with regard to machine translation. So they're by far not the only method. And Oksana uh, would certainly argue that uh, there is still room for a good rule, <laughs> a good old rule based engine. But uh, it's not the point. Uh, and the, and the, it's all about the machine translation, which is using dictionaries. So the question comes, what, what can you do when you don't have a dictionary? Because 
the language comes from outer space, or in our situation, it was last spoken 2,000 years ago or more. Uh, and we don't have a Rosetta Stone to, to help us decipher. So, so actually, it's about lost languages. And it's not in the, in the uh, Smart Zero article, but uh, in Sima Tass report, uh, she does make the distinction between um, the uh, dead language, the extinct language, and the lost language. And that's, that's very interesting. So the, the dead language is, is one that is not the native language of any community, like Latin. It's a dead language. Um, you have people who can read and speak and, and understand everything they read, but it's not a, it's not a living language. An extinct language is a, has no longer any any speakers. So you can still have books, you can have monuments, stellas, a written proofs of its existence, um, but it's not spoken by anyone anymore. Now, a, on some of those extinct language, we can, uh, we, we can, we can work, we can read, we can understand, we, we decipher them. I mentioned the Rosetta Stone, um, hieroglyphs, for instance, um, they're, they're, I'm not uh, that familiar, but uh, I believe perfectly understood. Uh, and we can uh, we can read uh, any Egyptian scripture. Um, and we report 573 extinct languages. Now, among those, most of them are lost, meaning there is no no way we we don't understand. It's gibberish, scribble, and and it's uh, we know it's existed, and we can't read it. We can't we can't do anything. Anything with that. So that's pretty much the challenge that the a team from the MIT has been working on. Uh, try to, to do something with those uh, languages. Um, now, the deciphering of outer space languages is a little bit uh, far away from uh, their, the, their work, but they, they made really fascinated, uh, fascinating uh, achievements. Um, Actually, they work on the similarities uh, between the languages and the probability of specific alteration, uh, and that allows them to connect the dots. So, uh, one example that I could think of, which is not uh, in our article, but uh, the, the the word for father in German, Vater, uh, you immediately, if you don't understand German, you, you recognize you have the F sound at the beginning, you have the A, T, the R at the end. It's, it's very, uh, it's very common. Now you can approach that to, uh, Persian, uh, Pedar. Uh, F and P are, are very, are very close, actually. Uh, in some languages, uh, it's even the same letter, like in Hebrew, for instance. Uh, and, and then you have the D, the, the, and the Ra the, at the end. So you, you immediately see, understand the similarity. So there, there is a connection between those words, which, uh, are pronounced the same, look the same, and actually they, they mean the same thing. Um, and probably I, I went ahead and find a Sanskrit uh, uh, possibility of, of relationship, which is Peter, and, and that's also uh, looks very, very similar. So uh, in this lab of the MIT, which is the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, CSAIL, uh, they, they, they worked on that, uh, on the distances between the, between the languages. Um, and they applied their algorithm on, on lost languages, which actually have been deciphered. Uh, so it took decades of manual work to, to, to work around. Um, but we believe that, uh, that we can now read those scriptures, which are uh, Ugaritic, uh, which is related to Hebrew and linear B. A very interesting name for a language which is related to Greek. Uh, and those uh, applying the algorithm to those languages uh, shows that, that, yeah, you can decipher the languages the way we know to do because we've done it manually. So if you apply, because you're, the, the algorithm works on the, the distance between the languages, 
um, you can apply it to other languages which for which we don't really know if they are parent to to what language and they took the uh, Iberian language so it's some some language that was spoken in the area of Spain uh, hence the name Iberian uh, which was believed or it's still disputed between scholars if it's related to a Basque uh, or Latin or Greek and the the application of the algorithm shows that it's too distant and it's quite unlikely that it's related to any of those languages so the the question of Iberian is still still open um, and now now the big hopes are for uh, for the future to to decipher completely the totally lost languages without inferring any related language and to be able to to understand what it means even though you, you have no idea how it was pronounced and 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 obviously how to read it and that means and that means that Boys and girls. we're about we we're about to know how close to french dothraki is <laughs> <laughs> that that's a special for our viewers from last time but um that's the that was the idea there is there is big hopes to uh to apply those types of algorithm to totally unknown languages from within without relation to without translating actually it's uh, understanding from within so it's a very um interesting uh piece and then uh, and thank you for uh to uh, Simatas for for this uh, this nice report, in addition to the swap to zero. Thinking, what is the real world application of this? Um, apart from the sake of learning more and and knowing what is written on this Stella that we found in the backyard. Um, nothing. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, I think it has huge um, implications for for humanity because we can learn about those <clears throat> uh, lost cultures. You know, uh, we can learn more about their life or their achievements. Um, so great application. I found that article fascinating too because it talked about in the past <clears throat> it took 20 30 years to many humans to try to uh, understand and try to map out the language grammar and just kind of the mechanics of the language where um, the AI was able to to do it in a, a relatively short time so so I think this is a, a amazing application of AI for me. Uh, you know, I, I just thought it was uh, brilliant that this is what they uh, used it for. So great, uh, great article. Good one. And uh, thinking about the applications further, uh, further away, if you're able to understand and decipher, maybe you're you're able to produce the content. Mm -hmm. And there we go. You have your machine translation for those uh, underrepresented languages, uh, which uh, which are even it's even easier because it's spoken. You can you, you bring can bring the guy and teach the machine to to produce the, mm -hmm. the thing, even though you don't have all those uh, tons of gigabytes of uh, of the training data that you need. Right. So, yeah. Exactly. I was I was just thinking the same thing. Going back to our little project, mm -hmm. technically, if you have many underrepresented languages that are close to each other, then technically you just need to find one person who is good, and then you kind of like adapt it to the other languages using the algorithm if it was able to produce translations or content. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Now we have it. Now we have the no, real world application. So you have to go back to MIT and tell them you guys need to share your algorithm with us because we have to save the world. Right. So Regina. We need <laughs> <laughs> this is like a master plan. That's <laughs> all the resources. But I feel I feel good about this. I think. Uh, so we were recently doing a, a trailer 
together for multilingual for the for the for the fall series it was like a series of webinars and one of the one of the clip was from natalie kelly by the way mm, <laughs> hello my friend I mentioned natalie today so we have to do it <laughs> <laughs> and she mentioned there it was a discussion with with jennifer johnson as well from autodesk and she mentioned that we are like a global glue because localization interferes with many departments in the company and you have visibility into those little things, then you can kind of like, you know, get the other departments to talk to each other. Like it's not only the, the role of HR or the CEO, but also localization kind of like connects these pieces together. And now that I'm thinking about this, that's what we're doing right here, right now, mm -hmm. because like we're connecting the little pieces, you know, translators with our borders, WHO, MIT, all these different people, you know, so I... I'm really enjoying this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that was our original mission and idea is to kind of get through the politics and yes. Um, yes. put help where the help is yes. needed, right? Don't don't vote Trump, but otherwise we don't talk about politics. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's, that's that's yeah, all done. It's, that's it's too late through. anyways. Right. Yeah. Very good. Anything more about the lost languages? Um, do, do they have a list of the languages or how do they know how the languages are actually called? If they're... I don't believe they know. If it's lost, you really have no, mm -hmm. nothing. I mean, you, right. you, have, you have a piece of stone and writing on it and, and that's it. Um, there's no clue on how to pronounce it. There's no... It's lost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the last part of, of lost. So do, do they provide any kind of, um, I guess, reference to the AI? Like this, it came from a stone in this region of the world and it was found in, um, you know, under a city something or, or it was in a, like that's, does the AI have that reference? to maybe infer what what the text could be about like yeah yes they um i'm not i'm not sure it matters so much uh, i'll tell you one minute but uh, the the article neither the one from smart to zero nor the uh the report in um data science uh, towards data science um they, they don't 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 mention anything and I, I didn't go so far as to read the the actual MIT uh, publication, mm -hmm. but um, a, but yes, the 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 work they've done and, and the examples they've used uh, were very localized. I mean, geographically. So when when you work on uh, Ugaritic, whatever how, whichever way you pronounce that, um, knowing that it's related to Hebrew. Uh, they gave that information to uh, to the machine. Mm -hmm. And please, someone from MIT, correct me if I'm wrong, and I didn't understand that because we're live now. <laughs> uh, but uh, when you're in the chat right now, like right now, <laughs> um, and I don't, I'm not sure it matters so much because take the example of uh, Iberian, which you, you you very much know where it is, and, and still you, you can't connect it to the languages around. Or Basque, uh, which is still spoken and, and still something not totally understood. I understand that um, it's a, it's a small region, uh, the north of Spain and south of France at, uh, just at the border. Uh, and, and they have their language, which is nothing like nothing else. So. Uh, even if you know that it's from there, uh, trying to 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 use the fact that uh, it comes from uh, northern Spain and, and infer uh, with with the languages around, uh, actually the the algorithm proved that it's too far away from uh, Iberian. It's too far away from Basque and from Greek uh, and from older Germanic languages, I believe, uh, to to be related to them. So. It's it's the it's the first conclusions uh, of the of the machine output doesn't mean it's not related. It's, uh, statistically, it's weird that would be 
that it would be connected. So, so I'm not sure how how important uh, the information of where it was it is coming from uh, for the algorithm. But but obviously, if you're trying to understand, knowing that there are transfers, I mean, obviously in, between Czech and Slovak, there must be very obvious examples of transfers of uh, of letters that you replace one by the other, and that's it. You got your mm-hmm. yeah the word in the other sure. language. Mm. So. Yes, I'm thinking Very about good. I'm thinking about the Veverichka. The <laughs> Yeah. How do you say it in mm. Czech? It's a squirrel, by the way. The Veverka. The Veverka. Right. Okay. How about we move to the last article, Virka? Okay. Because you also sure. had some initiative in mind. Initiative <laughs> number two, because we don't have we don't know. enough. We to don't do have it, enough. So. <laughs> Right, right. Uh, okay, so my article is called Plain Language Writing, Essential Part of Accessibility. And um, it was published in Forbes on October 22nd of this year. So um, it has to do about um, producing a plain enough language and plain enough text for people who might have intellectual developmental or learning disabilities. Because this is a group which, um, for which there is not proper accessibility provided yet. You know, for for people who are visually impaired, um, there is braille, there is large print, there is, excuse me, there, there are ways that they can access the text uh, for you know people who are hearing impaired or or other disabilities. Um, this is being considered quite largely, but for people with the intellectual or developmental um, disabilities, the text which is currently available to them is not altered oftentimes, so they can understand it. So the article spoke about um, the art of plain language writing, where the more complex text is distilled down to the main message using um, very common words, using short sentences and making it understandable or just summarizing it in very simple terms. So, so that message is accessible to them. And um, translation was also included um, in it and also the approach. So the translation side um, of this topic was not really um, developed in that article at all. It was mainly focused on English and how there are writers out there who can take the text and they can uh, preserve the information but make it accessible and readable uh, for for the audience uh, from this this group. Um, for translation, it was just mentioned briefly, but what I was uh, looking at and, and thinking about is, do you take that article, the complex article, and translate it directly into plain language, um, in mm-hmm. the plain text? Uh, or do you have it first, um, the, the source taken and transferred into the plain text and then just translate it? And um, I was thinking, you know, what what is needed is uh, is uh, putting together style guides, putting together um, the kind of a cookbook on how to do this right. And uh, that it certainly is a, a good area where we can all be more proactive and uh, we can we can talk to our clients about. Uh, is this something which which you are doing right now, or should you be doing that to make your material more accessible to uh, to a wider audience or to where it comes? You know, um, so so and then well, as I was thinking about it, I was thinking about other ways. You know, what about just books um, for pleasure reading, right? For for uh, for not just messages which are you know important from you know different different uh, business 
uh, or help uh, clients. But what about just making other texts which we all enjoy accessible to to people who might have learning disability or you know um, developmental or intellectual disability um i think we are forgetting about this um uh, this part of our population and and uh so that article sparked another <laughs> area where where we could be useful um as in language community, and uh, we can focus more on uh, trying to make more more text accessible to others. I think with machine translation, with uh, all the uh, activities of you know last twenty years, there has been a lot of wealth which um, which is written, which has been um, which has been uncovered for and and widely available to to um, the you know humanity, um, but we we can even do better and bring it to the groups where um, there are disabilities. So, so that's that's what that article was about. I don't need to get into too much detail in it. It yeah. was basically basically just this, you know, how can you? And I think it's interesting for us who we you know we're in the art of translation where we want to accurately with all the information available uh make make uh adapt into all these different languages we don't really talk about leaving things out <laughs> too too often you know we we talk more about including all the information but this is leaving things out but preserving all the you know the sense of the stories so. Yeah, I, I had a couple of thoughts while you were sharing the summary of the article and your your thoughts on the initiative. One of the first things, and you even brought up yourself, is who should be actually leading this initiative? Because you know, like the the, the whole localization industry, especially LSPs, we are mostly in the position where we are like, okay, this is what we are given by the client, and then we do our magic. Do you think that the clients would even start listening to this? to kind of like simplify their source text i think so i think um i think there will be clients who <clears> would be open to it you know i think especially the health uh healthcare clients would would uh, want to tackle this or the education you know um from from um i i you know i don't know the textbooks for example if they are um available uh, in the plain writing for for uh, children or you know adults who are who are learning so so there should be interest coming from clients potential clients right but uh, um, I think it's just kind of widening our horizons and we ever get into position to speak with uh, with some of the stakeholders in those industries it's, it's certainly a way to to bring bring this to the forefront more there are two perspectives that i see mm -hmm. and actually i'm just going to repeat what you said one of them is that the clients change the way they write a source which the article is about right making the writing more accessible and the second thing is where the english stays as it is but we as a as a as a translation community uh take the effort and simplify it and is this something that you have already been doing for some cases like for example let's say you see like the the quality we don't talk much about the quality of the source text a lot you know sometimes mm -hmm. it has issues we report those at least we used to do with our previous in my previous job but what what, what about when it comes to the complexity of the of the sentence do you report it back to the client do you just take the direction and just simplify it in the translation without leaving any important message out or do you do translators try to stick to it because that's what they think is expected of them so uh from uh, my current uh, job uh we at accordi serve to a lot of healthcare clients and they often ask for translation in the fifth grade 
uh, level of yeah. understanding, right? So, so there is certain simplification happening already. Um, this is, I think, even step further. So, okay, um, if I can interrupt quickly, my mm -hmm. question is: so, if they ask you for that, does it mean that what what grade level is the source text that they give to you if they have to ask you for this? Is is the source already? grade level five and they just make it explicit that you need to stick to the same complexity or do they give you something more complex and they, they just ask you to adjust it to to lower the complexity only for the translation yeah i i don't i don't believe um i i mean it is in that grade level in english already mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you just need to stay with that when mm -hmm. you are translating mm -hmm. right so so there's no adjustment which is being made um, in that way. But um, but again, I think it it depends on the target audience. You wouldn't just take complex text and translate it in a plain language um, just you know for the heck of it to make it more <laughs> accessible to everybody. So so it will have to be in unison uh, with the client and the intent. You know. But I think that it could be done both ways. So let's say, for example, it's a school, right? And they, they have a textbook for, for their students, but they also want to make it accessible to, to the, uh, um, developmentally or learning, you know, people with learning disabilities. Then you can take that textbook and you can directly make it into plain language in, in that language you are translating into. I think it's certainly doable, right? To 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 do it that way. Um so just just thinking about the different applications of of the plain language writing and where it would be uh you know where, where it would be appropriate. Um so I, I think it can be done both ways and, and it again would have to be something um where the client would have to share the needs and, and uh, agree on on the step. Ilan, yeah, say yeah, something yeah. smart. Um, before that, I have to say it made me feel very uncomfortable reading that article um, because that's the elitistic French in me saying, what <laughs> are you crazy um but uh but i'll get to that after the is that different from the simple english because a few years back it, there was a, a big hype about simple english and, and the aim was to write in sixth grade level if i remember correctly and here from the article it's uh it, it reads like you're you're targeting five and lower Mm -hmm. So, so how it's, it is different? How it low is. are you going to 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 mm -hmm. get? I mean, it's it's beyond. First of all, it asks a question: Is any idea conveyable to at any level? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and where it got even more uncomfortable is when I realized that actually. Lots of the recommendations I realized uh, I'm doing uh, when I write an email, for instance, like one ID and that's it. Uh, if you have to have two ideas, then you have two separate paragraphs and make short sentences and don't use words that you're very proud of being able to, to fit there because surely nobody knows them. Uh, and, and, and that causes confusion. And I think so. So I, I felt like you can't do that. You can't possibly be suggesting to to lower everything to 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 the, the lowest level, but actually, hey, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> so so yes, maybe there is some logic to it. So uh, how in in how do you see the difference between simple English and, and plain language? Yeah, I think different intention, <clears throat> right? Um, so simple English was also, um, also suggested at one time, if I remember correctly, several years ago, 
for um, machine translation, the ease of machine translation, you know, applying machine translation. So if you have if you have uh, it written in a simple English, um, then you have better outcome. You know, even though it's like a um, neutral English even was being used for for that. Uh, I think plain language writing in itself, the way they described it, it's going, you know, one step further, just uh, really thinking about being concise, meaning, um, making sure the meaning is, uh, is, is uh, um, preserved, but speaking to that person who might have a um, hard time even understanding, you know, simple English, the way things are written, they are actually speaking to the mental abilities of the audience. And I think it, it is an art. It's really not that easy to just do short sentences and, and kind of scrub the paragraph so it's, you know, simple. I think you also need to be thinking about that target audience and how are you going to reach them best. You know, should you use an example? I, I noticed in the article they were talking in abstract language, like third person, but for the simple language writing, it's spoken first person. It says, I am Sarah and I am 34 years old. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's more speaking to, to that audience. So, so it's not just taking it, it's also thinking about who is going to be reading it and how can I reach them. So well, I'm, I want to um, understand why did the article make you uncomfortable? I, I, um, I don't know. I, it's um, it's First of all, just uh, before uh, I get to that, the, the uh, if you ask your translators to, to to change the level as they translate, when they, they get whatever they get, and you think, okay, now you're going to translate and lower the level, um, I, I think it uh, it's beyond translation. It's it's mm -hmm. something else. It's a um, it will so, certainly require other skills, uh, completely defeat the anything they, they've learned in their uh, in, in their uh, education of, of uh, if they have a formal translation education. Um, so, so that, that that is also going to be a challenge, but probably not that different from what we encounter in transcreation. Transcreation, yeah, exactly. You're telling them. Mm -hmm make your own mm -hmm. um the uncomfortable was about a so that means that you 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 can't express yourself um so obviously it's not a, applicable to all ideas and all types of documents and, and everything but um but when you you when you compose your message uh you're in addition to the the the, the idea you you also conveying something else i mean a... emotions feelings mm -hmm. yeah and uh, and, um, and and an experience of of the language you want to pass uh, and so you're saying forget about that now you're talking to kindergarten and try try something else and that's not the message i wanted to pass so uh, I'm, I'm going to create this this uh, um, fashion, this trend, this this new normal of from now on, just lower your level, um, and it, it's counterintuitive. I mean, you, you're trying to 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 bring everyone up and and, and educate and and give them more elaborate ways of thinking and and expressing themselves and, and when they got to that level you go okay now <laughs> go down so that that made me a little bit uncomfortable now it, when you read the article it's it does uh, it does say something else and it does take to you to another uh, another direction so 
So my uh, uncomfortability changed as, as I was reading. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but eventually the, the, the practical recommendation, uh, that they, they're, they're suggesting to, uh, to, to fit that, um, that's the, that's the, the basic, uh, the basic guidelines that, that I've set to myself when, when writing business communication. Keep it simple. Uh, you're, you're talking not in your, um, mother tongue to people, not in their mother tongue. You need to, to be sure there's no ambiguity because you don't want that. And, um, and, and we need to, to pass the, the message. I mean, we need to, to ensure the message is received and understood. So you, you need to simplify a lot. Um, yeah. It kind of shows what you think of your audience when you're right. <laughs> you know. Um, but uh, but it's, no, it's I think you're not true. taking any chances. Just just right. You want to be understood. Right. Yeah. 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 And I I can I can say that that it I write that way too. I do a lot of bullet points and organize it so the message is you know right there. So I think we do that when we want to be understood. <laughs> unconscious yeah. you know conscious it's an unconscious effort from what uh, i understood elon when you were sharing your thoughts on the article to me it seems like a balance between practicality and the art of the language you cannot have both sometimes and that would actually i think Virka, maybe you were even saying this should there be two sources like one that that is like for the majority of the people, and then one for uh, the people with the disabilities. Mm -hmm. Because maybe think, maybe yeah. to, to Elon's point, you don't want to bring the mainstream people to the grade level five, right? And and I think that's the intention here mm -hmm. to produce to produce that um, material, like to to make sure it's that material which is shared with. The general public and the uh, material is also accessible to those who are not, um, who might be, you know, uh, with the disabilities. So, so we definitely producing both. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Thinking, mm -hmm. thinking back about it. Uh, I think that's, that's what we're done. I'm scrolling now. That's, that's what she says about, or he, I don't know, uh, about, uh, accessibility. It's, it's really, um, intended in, a, in an accessibility uh, view that mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're going to have large characters for those who, who don't see this so well. So right. have a double source for, for those who don't understand everything. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. So, yeah. so yeah, that was, um, that was, that's what I was just thinking, you know, that like when we use our phones, <clears throat> like it's not by default that you have, I don't know, you know, large fonts or something like right, you right. just go yeah, and set it if you have mm -hmm. the requirement. But for majority of the people, you have the default, let's say the, the normal or mainstream version. Mm -hmm. So I think this is the same thing. And then also like right. when we were talking about like what a translator should be doing something, I think the optimal way is, of course, to go upstream, like it should start from the source right mm -hmm. source mm -hmm. should produce the things and then the translation should take it away from there um i have two 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 questions about this i mean questions slash comments one of the things that i was thinking about initially is when you were talking about accessibility i think i have seen something on canada's dragons then there was an app which scans pages from a book and automatically mm -hmm. gives you a summary Hmm. Isn't there any app that can do what we're just talking about automatically? Just simplify the text. Elon is smiling. Is that I was just project? thinking. <laughs> I was just thinking that's what we need. It's machine translation for to simplify. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, well, techni get, uh... technically, technically, you need algorithm to simplify English, right? Like we said, start mm -hmm. with upstream. So then you create yeah. the second version automatically because one of the reasons why companies won't be doing this, it's because of the ROI, right? It will take them extra effort to write it from scratch. But if it was mm -hmm. automated using AI, then it could go faster. And then if you also automate the, the translation part using MT, then technically we could provide at least something decent for these people and it would be viable 
business expense for the for the companies. Yeah, we would have to do some testing <laughs> to see how that's going to pan out. But uh, yeah, good idea. I mean, Spark Notes, right? We call it Spark Notes. Elon, side project for you? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> And the second thing that I was thinking about, you know, like when we talk about this uh, great level, like what is, I don't, I don't even know how to explain this. I only know about this thing and that's why I'm nodding is because when I did some copywriting courses, there's an app called Hemingway app. You can just mm -hmm. use it online. And when you write a text, it gives you the grade, like grade level five. I think you should mm -hmm. target to have grade eight or lower for whatever I'm doing. So mm -hmm. how, how do you guys, especially you, Virka, because you said that your clients have this requirement to be grade uh, five. So yeah, how, how, four, five, how, how do you six. check this for the localized languages? Is yeah, there, there is a tool. tool. Uh -huh. There is a tool. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so you can actually uh, validate it for the tool. Mm -hmm. so, is it like a standalone yeah. application or is it together with some QA checks? I don't know. What what is the tool? No, it's um yeah, I, I can give you all the details because I have never even uh explored it myself. But um yeah, there is a tool, it's an online tool. Um and uh you can you know evaluate the text by putting it through the tool to make sure that it is within that level. Um good idea for me to actually look at it more carefully to to understand how it works because uh that's uh, that's as far as i know that that there is a tool to yeah, you have it. a lot of uh, readability uh, evaluation yeah. tools yeah so it's a yeah it's a web-based so let's try to wrap up this whole thing i'm still unclear about our action items for this new thing did you did you for this new thing yes. yeah i think i just just being aware and uh and i i guess maybe think of a way where plain language writing could uh could be um something more widely used maybe some applications um you know, as i said education i see a big one healthcare is obviously uh you know, already I think government mandated uh, for accessibility, but only for as far as I know, it's for the hearing and visual impairment. Mm -hmm. um, and um, then, you know, like remediated text where you hover over the text and, and it speaks. Um, that's also an accessibility, which is already mandated. It's 508. Um, compliance which which uh government mandates the text is uh compliant to that so um, you know definitely applications there government uh government and uh healthcare uh already and that would be those those conversations we can already have with our clients and uh uh education i don't know to to what extent there are textbooks, for example, which are which are um, in plain language, you know. So, so maybe our mission or um, our um, action item <laughs> would be would be as thinking about how applicable this could be and where it could be applicable. I really like the idea of uh, uh, some automation being introduced. So. Um, I don't know. You techie guys want to take that? Well, Elon, w Elon will go and make friends at MIT for the first initiative. So you can ask them about this one as well. Right. We can, we can <laughs> bundle this one in. <laughs> 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 Why not? Right? Two, two, two for one, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Lost in so, play. Yeah. Um, sounds nice. Sounds nice. Do we have any uh, interactions on a... Uh, on the on the feed, uh, anybody's uh... no, it's dead right now. Mm. Wake okay. up, people! Yeah, wake uh, up, people! It's lunchtime. You know. <laughs> um, okay, interesting, interesting. The making uh, making the, the 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 
authors of the source or the owners of the source aware of the, the, the understandability level might be possible only after we make them aware of the quality of their source. And that's difficult. <laughs> so, so I, I, for the applicability uh, in clients, I, I'm not sure how far we, we can go there. But uh, I wouldn't try because we're the adventures. In the beginning, I was talking about that uh, in my previous job, we did have some um, kind of like internationalization report that we were trying to summarize for the clients who were writing all the copy that we got to translate. And we try to report to them how many issues there were. So this is not about like simplifying the text. It's just like you have this many issues and we are fixing it on your behalf so that then the issues don't propagate to all the languages that have to deal with this translation. Is this something that you guys are doing as well? I think it would be a good start mm -hmm. because you can then add the, the complexity of the source text to the discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are definitely doing that for our clients you know we have uh, we report that to them um, anytime we find source text errors and uh, and they are very appreciative of that as well actually so uh, definitely you know this is best practice for sure yeah yeah same here so we do we report and sometimes you get the unexpected answer yes but leave it anyways hmm yeah, yeah. So it's you validated. So you normally don't have the right to fix the source, never, or depends on the client. We uh, it depends what type of uh, of issues you have. And obviously, you're 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 giving back the translation and not the source, so it's not fixed. I mean, the the, the master source is still with them, so they would need to to fix it. Um, if you, if you realize you have a typo and, uh, uh, something that happens very often in as, as, and n, the article, and it's obvious. I mean, you know, which one is the correct one and uh, it's not even close on the keyboard, but I don't know. It happens a lot. Um, so, so that you fix on the fly and, uh, and you might report or, or not even report. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the more uh, serious problems when the, the the source contradicts itself or or for no reason you have twice the same sentence mm -hmm. uh, you do get sometimes leave it leave it it's it's there. Yeah, it's, it's validated text you, you don't touch that so, yeah. and I I would also said to say to that if you have source error and then you leave it right um then you have a mess in your on your translation memory right because mm -hmm. you are you have not met if you are correctly translating the correct um what should be correct right then it's not going to match because next time if you get the corrected uh, english it's not going to match your target um so so yeah, definitely. Um, if we can get the clients to fix it, I always have them to send us the fixed source so we can yeah. make sure that our translation memories are correct as well. Yeah. So. My final question is regarding this topic. I've only learned about context review in my last job with Global Me. They were doing it heavily for the client, but I haven't done it anywhere before. Like to me, like reviewing source text before you send it to translators was something new. Mm -hmm. So, so do you report these issues because the translators report to you, or do you have the stage of context review before you send it out? Yeah. So for, for some clients, we do actually source analysis, source text analysis before it goes into translation, so we can give mm -hmm. them even some tips on what they need to. They might need to split up some sentences especially sentences which include numerals, for example, for um, for software, for example. Um, so they would have, they can cover the different genders with numerals, you know, the concordance. 
So yeah, we we do that for some clients where we actually provide it as a service for sex analysis. And uh, yeah, but yeah, it's a good thing. We don't. Uh, we report what we find, but the this, this stage is never. We haven't been so uh, talented at selling that, so <laughs> 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 so it's not happening right. usually. Yeah. But okay. So, any final comments from you guys regarding the article or in general? We made it. I would like to say yeah. our first live stream. <laughs> so how are you feeling right now and i will not say anything because i will just affect you so how are you two feeling right now <laughs> much better was it, was it different mm -hmm. was it a different experience no no not you, really no. No. No, no 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 yes but no yes because it's it's very nice to to have a uh, joshua's comments uh, throughout Yes, we had Viviana. She also gave us a yeah. thumbs up right now, so she's not dead. <laughs> and we have a comment from Mr. <clears throat> Tucker Johnson. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, Tucker Johnson. So you don't know him, Ilan, yet, but he knows you because he's technically kind of like my boss right now and Vera's best friend. <laughs> so Tucker says, Vera makes some great points about source text analysis. How does source text analysis change for transcreation projects compared to translation projects? Yeah, so um, I can take it. Um, so for transcreation, um, you have to be really in sync with the uh, client's marketing <clears throat> marketing team or the team which produces the source to understand the intention of the message. So <clears throat> I need a drink, I guess. You need a water, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I think that's really important that to analyze it from that intent of that message and then um, being able to craft the transcreation uh, accordingly to, to, so, so that's different types of analysis. I think you analyze it from uh, what would be the suitable uh, transcreated message. What, what, how do you need to transcreate it by? Locale, you know, you have to refer to local, um, uh, you know, I guess, depending on what it is, right? But, but if it is, um, um, perhaps marketing of a new product being sold in a different location and you want to refer to local points of interest or local, I don't know, of customs and things like that and adapt it in that way um that that's what you need to understand where what is the product where is it being sold or what is the message how it's being sold um what is the ambiguity like in english uh, i know with a lot of the um it companies for example when they are launching a new product they they use very simple message but it has an ambiguity to it marketing ambiguity um, on purpose right on purpose and so making sure that if that's the intent how can it be um, transcreated for the given locale so that's the type of analysis i think it needs to be done from that perspective not from just plain technical perspective of mm. you know here's or sex, what, where, where do I see uh, could be issues? You, you know, you can do, you can do source text analysis looking at, oh, are all the menu items in the drop down menu are they all capitalized, or do you have like a mishmash of lowercase, uppercase, and you don't even realize it's being pulled into that menu, for example. So, so that's one type of source text analysis, as opposed to transcreation marketing you mentioned the word mishmash is that actually in english mishmash. or is it just our version i don't know is it <laughs> Yelan, do you understand the word mishmash yeah you do it, but it's used in hebrew so maybe <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> okay. you have a goulash or... <laughs> yeah, absolutely. another one right yeah. that one too okay. so yeah 
So when it comes to transcreation, is the source analysis more about making sure that you understand what the message is supposed to be rather than looking at grammatical issues mm -hmm. or right. complexity? Completely, yeah. Okay. So Viviana says, thank you for sharing your experience and thoughts. It was very interesting. Thank We're you, happy. Viviana, for thank staying you. so long. <laughs> Thank you, Viviana, for two yeah. hours, two hours, two hours. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you deserve I, I, a medal. Yeah. She did it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, final thoughts. I think that's where we left off before we went back to the to the topic. So how was your experience today? Very good. Very good. Very, I think it was good. good and uh, great discussion. Really, uh, really love your uh, Andre and Elan's uh, point of view. So, so a good, good discussion. Ilan, what about you? Very, very good. I feel uh, much relieved now that you're <laughs> approaching to this connection. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, as always, uh, good insights, very, very nice articles. And, uh, and we have lots of action items. So yes, maybe next time we'll change the format a little bit if we were gonna t going to have the guest okay sounds good i really like the practical aspect of our discussion like initiative so if we just next time just focus on that and we <laughs> teach the articles i wouldn't mind at all okay sounds good. because saving world is more important more than important reporting about amazon's <laughs> bad words on the website <laughs> what does viviana think about it viviana what do you think about it but i think there might be some delay so it will take some time until the answer oh, comes okay. back. Okay. So anyway. So we, we know next time. <laughs> yes, yes, next right. time. Send so, us a comment below. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys very much. Thanks everyone who was thank watching you. us, listening all the time. Uh, the recording of this uh, with a little bit of a better quality will be available on Multilingual's YouTube channel. That's what we're trying to build right now. I want to thank my guests again. Thank you for doing this with me. Uh, our very first experience with live stream together. It was fun as usually. And I will see you guys in one month. Thank Sounds you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.